The vast is the great and originating; all things hold their beginning; the various things appear in their developed forms. It is necessary to introduce into nature, two substances which differ essentially. These are the celestial and the elemental, the former being invariant and eternal, and the latter temporary and destructible. Pythagorean said that all things are determined by three, beginning, middle, and end. Which is the number of the whole? Is it not dictated by nature that we attribute the title of all to those things that are three? For two are called both, and one does not say all unless there are three. All, and whole, and perfect are formally one and the same, and that therefore among figures only the solid is complete. For it alone is determined by three, which is all, and, being divisible in three ways, it is divisible in every possible way. I feel no compulsion to grant that the number three is a perfect number, nor that it has a faculty of conferring perfection upon its possessors. If he had known that, or if it had occurred to him, The celestial is ingenerable, incorruptible, inalterable, impenetrable. All simple motions are confined to these three kinds, toward the center, away from the center, and around the center. Those bodies have a natural principle of motion, such as fire and earth. Motion in a straight line can have no place in nature, as long as we suppose the parts of the universe to be disposed in the best arrangement, and perfectly ordered. The sages grandly understand the connection between the end and the beginning. The method is to change and to transform, so that everything obtains its correct nature, as appointed by the mind of heaven, and thereafter the conditions of great harmony are preserved in union. There is no doubt that to maintain the optimum placement and perfect order of the parts of the universe as to local situation, nothing will do but circular motion or rest. As to motion by a straight line, let it be granted to us that nature makes use of this to restore particles of earth, water, air, fire, and every other integral mundane body to their whole, when any of them find themselves separated and transported into some improper place unless this restoration can also be made by finding some more appropriate circular motion. The terrestrial globe is not so, but corruptible and mortal, so that there will come a time when the sun and moon and other stars continuing their existence and their operations, the earth will not be found in the universe but will be annihilated along with the rest of the elements. They assign an upward motion to air and fire, which is a motion that never belongs to the said elements, but only to some of their particles, and even then only to restore them to perfect arrangement when they are out of their natural places. On the other hand, they call circular motion breeder natural to them, forgetting what Aristotle has said many times, that nothing violent can last very long. First there is that Aristotle, who would persuade us that sublunar bodies are by nature generable and corruptible, and are therefore very different in essence from celestial bodies, these being invariant, ingenerable, incorruptible. This argument is deduced from differences of simple motions. Is there perhaps someone who has seen one terrestrial globe decay, and another regenerated in its place? Is it not accepted by all philosophers, that very few stars in the heavens are smaller than the earth, while a great many are much bigger? So the decay of a star in heaven would be no less momentous than for the whole terrestrial globe to be destroyed. Now if, in order to be able to introduce generation and corruption into the universe with certainty, it is necessary that as vast a body, as a star must be corrupted and regenerated, then you had better give up the whole matter. The result is what is advantageous and correct and firm.